the opening round of the 1985 Shell Oil's British Open Rally Championship. The national breakdown rally had attracted a superb entry for this two-day international and amongst the competitors, the world's top lady rally driver, Michel Mouton. It's a challenge for me and a good opportunity to have this uh, unknown rally to push always your limit, your own limit, and I think it's a very good challenge for me to try to do it. Within minutes of the start, the competitors were tackling the tarmac special stages at Bradford's Bowling Park and Lightwater Valley. Michelle Mouton and the Audi UK Quattro set the pace as she powered the German four-wheel drive car into an early lead. Running at number two with the Duckham's Toyota, Group A would be a tough assignment for Swede Per Eklund, who sent the arrows flying. Penzio Rickler had started late with his Group A Opal and was immediately in trouble with a broken fan belt. Next came the more powerful Group B Opal of reigning champion Jimmy McRae. The Scotsman knew that retaining that title would be a tough task. Jimmy's AC Delco Manta was new, and so was his co-driver, Ian Grindrod. Jimmy's regular sparring partner and GM teammate, Russell Brooks, was at number six and trying hard as ever in his Manta. And Malcolm Wilson in his private quattro was very spectacular indeed. Many fancied Wilson to win this one, and in the opening stages, he was just seconds behind the factory car of Mouton. At number 10, the crowd favourite, Tony Pond, in the big Rover Vitesse, and he was definitely a contender for the Group A honours. Pond was, as always, on the limit as he headed for the forest. Welshman David Llewellyn, after winning the national title last year, has been promoted to the British Audi team and was motoring very hard on those opening stages. Ireland's Bertie Fisher in his GM Team Opal is away from home territory, but he was another destined to have a very good rally with his regular co-driver Austin Fraser. This is a very surprising Skoda. Norway's John Haglund in a Group B 130 LR all the way from Czechoslovakia. He was the strong favourite for the new 1300cc class in the championship. Malcolm Wilson was in superb form, and once a rally moved into the North Yorkshire Forest, he had overhauled Michel Mouton for the lead. But could Malcolm stay in front around the dusty tracks on the old Croft race circuit? Wilson's car and co-driver Nigel Harris knew exactly where they were going. Behind, there was a superb battle for the honour of the best two-wheel drive car in the rally, and Terry Cabey in the Nissan was fifth, chasing the Opals hard. The ebullient Tony Pond was leading Group A, but disaster was around the corner. Soon after Croft, he would retire due to a blown head gasket, but many predict that the Computer Vision Rover will be a Group A winner soon. They say that no man is faster downhill than Michael Sundstrom in a little Peugeot, but he is quick on the flat too and was in the thick of the Group A struggle, matching the times of Eklund and Pond. Louise Aitken Walker was getting to grips with a sister car, but sadly Sundstrom retired after hitting a rock and Louise dropped out too. Another Group A contender, John Midgley in his Silkeline Toyota, but he had been slowed by early handling problems but was now happy. came up after a tough night, the leaderboard had a new look about it. Still ahead, now by a sizeable margin, was Malcolm Wilson. Mouton was out after clouting a rock and breaking the suspension. The morning sun lit up the tired faces of the crews still remaining, but the daunting Dolby Forest was still in front of them. Russell Brooks, with Mike Broad on the maps, was firmly in second place, but unable to challenge, it appeared. But champion McRae was out with a broken oil pump. That man Terry Cavey was still spectacular in the Nissan and was in a strong third position. The Oliver's Mount motorcycle racing circuit on the outskirts of Scarborough and a big crowd to watch Chris Lord. Tarmac ace Bertie Fisher overshot the tight hairpin but just scrabbled round. 
That's more than you can say for Cyril Bolton. Yes, Cyril, the bikes go up the hill, but you don't. You're going to have to fall on the 84 hours now. Really running. And two seconds behind Michel Couture. In the middle of Dolby, and the little Skoda of Hagland is up in the top ten. Here is Wilson, and he is definitely limping after trouble at Oliver's mouth. Russell Brooks may be able to snatch a lucky victory, and he is only three minutes down on Wilson now. Here is Malcolm Wilson again, and he is definitely in trouble. Look, that escort seems to be catching him up. This is desperate indeed, and the next service at the fire tower in the middle of Dolby will be crucial, where the service crew are still debating what they should do. Well, he's just lost all drive on the rear end on stage 46, and he's just doing 47. Coming back here, and then we're hoping to change the diff here and see what happens then. If they change it in time, I mean, the car will be running perfectly again, and uh, I really can't see us catching it. If they didn't change it in time, it would be excluded. We've had to do the last three stages with just two-wheel drive, and uh, we haven't been able to find out what, what it is exactly, but we think it's now the front differential. So if that is the case, we'll have to continue with just two-wheel drive for the rest of the rally and hope that we can just maintain our lead. How badly does that hamper you? Oh, very, very much so. I mean, Russell took 16 offers in there, so I don't know how many miles of stage is left, but it's quite a tall order. Malcolm is yet to win a British international. Will he be denied within sight of the finish? Howard House, the last of the 51 stages, and the now two-wheel drive Audi was still limping, but still in the lead. Surely he would make the final run back into Bradford. Russell Brooks was happy to be second, but still waiting to pounce if Wilson's car broke. <laughs> After a superb drive, coming home for an excellent third place was Terry Cabey in the Nissan. Chris Lord was set for fourth place in his Audi. Chris had had a very nice day, thank you. Bertie Fisher slotted into fifth position with his Opal and now looks forward to his home circuit of Ireland. Group A victor and a superb sixth overall for Per Eklund and his co-driver Dave Whittock. Finally, back to Bradford and Malcolm Wilson and Nigel Harris managed to make it to the end. Their first British international win and the first win by Britain in this tough event for eight years. At the finish, Malcolm was a mixture of relief and joy as he sprayed the champagne and then told me how he felt. In the last eight stages, it's been fingers crossed, legs crossed, everything crossed. It's been unreal. We've had to do the last eight stages with just two-wheel drive, and obviously it's quite a handful. We could certainly see you battling there. Did you think you were going to make it? There was a point on the run into the last stage when I thought we were, not because the gearbox got so noisy, um, I honestly thought it was going to just blow, explode. Well, it didn't go bang, and Malcolm's wife, Elaine, rewards him with a victory embrace. Nice one, Malcolm. Can I share this very special